JLR Investigates. I am at Crime Con in Orlando, Florida, the exhibit booths, and I'm here with the CEO of Othram. Othram. And if um, you've been following true crime, you might have been hearing about this company called Othram. And, and this is the CEO, David Middleman, and he's taken the time to speak and uh, answer some questions. Uh, David, thank you for taking the time speaking to me. Othram, tell us about Othram. Uh, Othram's a, a DNA testing laboratory and a tech company, and uh, we, we work exclusively in forensic investigations to help identify contributors to crime scenes. So if there's any DNA evidence at a crime scene, maybe it's the DNA evidence of a victim or a suspect to a crime, uh, we come in and help analyze that DNA using some really novel technology um, to help identify uh, who the person is that left that DNA. And I've been seeing you guys in the news lately solving lots of old, cold cases going back decades. Yeah, we, we have cases that uh, extend past 100 years and cases that are very new and you can get a little bit of a glimpse of it from this, uh, from this, this exhibit. Like, um, uh, it's, a, it's a glimpse of the future. Uh, you know, what's possible when there's a world in which everyone can get answers and, and we can see uh, certainty in investigations. So we're very uh, very excited to be able to, uh, to bring this technology everywhere and we're hoping in the future we can deploy the technology to uh, public laboratories, to other partners, and, and eventually this board fills up and it's a universe of, of good news and answers for families. How did you come up with the name Othram? Uh, well, you know, Othram is actually, a, it's, a, it's, it's from Lord of the Rings. It's, uh, Othram was the wall that lined the city and it, it protected the city from external threats. And, um, and so, so we, are, we are also building technology that um, you know, protects and benefits society at large, whether it's identifying victims of crimes that can then lead to the identification of those that killed them, or, or directly looking for suspects in crimes. And or you know, in some cases, even uh, working to exonerate uh, folks that have been in, inappropriately uh, accused of a crime. Have you done that? We have. We have a really interesting, well, we have a couple of interesting cases, but we have one case where there was a, a homicide was in Las Vegas. There was a homicide, and uh, there was no evidence uh, inside the bar. But outside the bar, they found a pool of blood, and they thought maybe this is blood from someone that was doing lookout, you know, for the for the day that the crime happened. And so that DNA was collected. They did the testing that they normally do, put it into CODIS, and they've been looking ever since for who this person was. So they sent it to Othram, and we track it down, and we find the person. But here's the thing. That person actually wasn't part of the crime. That person uh, was involved in an accident. That's how the blood got on the ground. It happened days before the event. And, and that person is not, really, not related at all to the case. And so that person's DNA was in CODIS for no reason. It got pulled out and, and that person was excluded or you know, exonerated in, uh, from, from being considered as involved in that crime. So it's important. You know, One thing I always talk about, and if I have like a quick, quick message for everyone, is that we want to reduce the uncertainty in investigations. So there's, there's a lot of uncertainty in the crime scene evidence and all the facts. You don't know exactly what happened because you weren't there. But when you go to court, you have to speak with certainty as to what happened. And so our goal is to build technology that reduces uncertainty. Find out where that DNA came from. Let the investigators determine, is that person part of the investigation or not? Should they be excluded? Should they be considered as a suspect? And in doing that, make sure that we don't look at the wrong person. We do find the right person. And when we're identifying victims, families don't have to wait decades to get answers. Yeah. And uh, so in reference to cold cases, how, do, how does it... How does a case end up in your, your lab, on your lap? We have, we have law enforcement all over the country. This is at the local, state, and federal level uh, that will reach out to us, and they'll tell us about a case that they have. They've tried the traditional methods, the conventional tools, and they've run out of leads, and they don't know what to do next. And, um, and so, so then we will examine the case. We'll do an extensive review. If we feel that we can bring a value on top of that, we'll take on the case, and then we'll use our approach to see if we can generate new leads. And, and if we can, we'll deliver those leads to investigators, and that allows them to continue the investigation. They've exhausted all the leads before they came to us. The person's not in CODIS. There's no other information that connects the dots. And generally, what we do is we provide just a little bit more information that pushes them over that barrier uh, so that they can continue the investigation. So how many cases total have you guys uh, solved? So well, we, we've identified, we've made identifications in uh, more than 1,200 cases. Oh. Yeah, if, if you look at our website, authorum.com, you'll see a list of publicly announced cases. There, there's, I don't know, maybe close to 250 right now. 
and, um, and and more will be announced. Unfortunately, there is a lag time between um, when we help solve a case and when that case is announced publicly. Sometimes the case has to go through the court system. Sometimes it's just an identification, but there's a lot of paperwork. You got to inform the family. So we're very excited to share the success. We're really big proponents of transparency. We want to get the word out to the public, but we got to we got to do it at the pace. Um, that, that, that we're allowed to do it at. And so we won't make an announcement unless law enforcement makes the announcement first or they, in writing, authorized us or instructed us to announce information. How many employees you got? We have, um, uh, we have uh, over 60 employees now, maybe even 65. And um, it's, a, it's a really wonderful team. Most of the people on our team have had a personal story, a personal brush with crime or the loss of a loved one. Um, they come from incredibly diverse backgrounds. Um, the training sets are very different. We've got computer scientists, um, genetic genealogists, laboratory people, um, people that just are experts in world history and understand how to trace, you know, um, you know, ancestry and family lines. Um, people that do data analysis, just all kinds of folks. Um, case managers that that help law enforcement, you know, make an assessment: is their case good for this method? Our technology is really great. But just because you have great technology doesn't mean that it's right for every case. So we want to make sure we're taking on the cases that we think are best likely to benefit from the technology. So you do decline cases? We decline a lot of cases. And, you know, I'll tell you, uh, if you ever come to visit our facility... Which I would like to. You should, and you could you could host a little uh, live uh, show from, oh, that'd the, be awesome. from, the, from the actual uh, location. You'll see that um, we built the first forensic lab of this kind that, um, that does this work entirely in-house. But now what we've done is we've built a second laboratory right next to the forensic laboratory, and it's all research. And all we do is look at casework, um, you know, casework that we don't feel comfortable taking. We will take uh, essentially a mock version of that casework, and we will work in the, because we don't want to experiment on real casework. We'll take a mock version of that, and we'll look in the research lab at how we can develop new methods to make it work. So it's not uncommon. In fact, many of the cases you see here on the board, this one right here uh, is a good example, Sherry Ann Jarvis. So there was really very little evidence left um, in her case. Uh, in fact, what was left was an autopsy slide that had been fixed in formaldehyde. This is this chemical that like preserves uh, biological material. But when it preserves biological material, it, it makes it impossible really to get good DNA for testing. It's like, you know, the, but, the butterflies that you like, you can spray them with that fixative, but then if you touch the butterfly, it bursts into dust. That's what happens to the, the human tissue when you fix it in formaldehyde. And so we didn't know that we could take on this case. We said, please, we have to reject it right now. We're going to pause it. We did a lot of work, though, in the lab to figure out how to work with formaldehyde. Eventually figured it out, came back to them six months later and said, we rejected the case, but we're ready to work it now. And then we took the case on, and it's, as you can see, now solved. And we then went back and looked at every other case we've ever gotten that shared those same properties, the formaldehyde, other fixatives, and have gone on to do that. So we're very, very comfortable rejecting cases if we don't feel like it's ready, because we know the technology is rapidly evolving, and we have no problem coming back three to four months. Once a case comes to Othram, it's in our hearts forever, it sits on a backlog, and as soon as we feel comfortable, we'll come back to law enforcement and work it. So how are you guys funded? Um, we are funded primarily through law enforcement. So law enforcement has uh, state and local funding to work some of these cases. And then they have federal funding. The Department of Justice has a program um, through the Bureau of Justice Assistance that allows uh, the distribution of federal funds to work some of these cases. There is not enough funding to work the magnitude of cases. That's changing. Um, we're, we're advocating, you know, obviously for more funding for this kind of method. Um, again, for, for funding for laboratory improvements so that the public labs can get the modernization and upgrades that they need to be able to do this work themselves as well. And, um, and so as federal funding increases, we're able to then get more of the cases worked. The second way that we're funded is through philanthropy. We have a website, dnasolves.com. It's a DNA -S -O -L -V -E -S com, And we will we'll literally crowdfund a case if we have to. Like, we'll have cases where, like in Connecticut, we're working some cases where we're crowdfunding and people chip in their, their, their lunch money or coffee money, and we've crowdfunded a number of cases. I remember we were talking beforehand, you were talking about crowdfunding the last crime for crime. You crowdfunded yeah, I'll, it. Yeah, I'll tell you a really fast story. Last year, so, so crowdfunding with kind strangers, then obviously some nonprofits and other foundations that advocate will help fund some of our cases. And then, yeah, like another example is last year at CrimeCon, we came uh, with a case it was a case uh, from Fairfax, Virginia, 
It was a girl, they said she was African American and she died in 2001. And they've never been able to figure out anything about her identity. So we do the DNA testing on this case, but to do all this work, we, we had to get funding. The agency didn't have funding for this case. And we brought it to CrimeCon, we had a booth, and we said, look, this is the one case we want your help with. The crowdfund community, crowd, uh, the CrimeCon community funded it in 24 hours. And we, um, we then did the testing. It's a crazy story. It turns out she was not African American, and she didn't die in 2001. She was a French woman who was murdered in 1975. And, and, and she had family to this day that was still looking for her. And so we were able to properly identify her, get those leads back to law enforcement, and they're working the rest of the case. And all of that was made possible quite literally by the folks that were here at CrimeCon. So, so there's a lot of ways to, to, to work the cases and fund them. I think philanthropy is something it's, it's really special anytime it wants to help fund a case, but obviously philanthropy is a, uh, is a bridge. It's a bridge funding kind of situation. In the long term, you do want the Department of Justice and, and the U.S. government at large to take on more of this, and they will. It's a new technology. It takes time to make it into the budgets to, uh, to set the standards and the benchmarks and the, and the kind of the guardrails for how to deploy this technology and fund it, but it'll happen, and we're, we're just very excited. You know, the technological barriers are gone. Yeah. This is not science fiction, it's science fact, it's ready right now, it's used in cases of all kinds all over the U.S., and what we need now is to get the word out on the technology, to share with folks really the true magnitude at which it can bring value, and then, and then to wait as funding increases and, and law enforcement is empowered to use a method. David, I have to ask you, when you identify a cold case, what are the reactions from the family Do when they when you identified the, someone? The, the families are always, they're always excited to, to hear the answer. I think, you know, a lot of these cases, when, 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 when they happen, you know, you see it in the news, it, it affects everyone, but, but the family is disproportionately affected, obviously, and, and, they, and they never stop thinking about it. And, and sometimes these family members are almost frozen in time. It's like, this feels like it happened yesterday. I know we've, we've delivered information before, and it's like, you know, when you deliver information to these families, um, sometimes they hear the messages that it just happened yesterday. It's very painful and it's something that's really consumed them. And, um, and, and being able to give them that answer, um, you know, I think closure is an over, kind of an over-exaggeration of what happens, but to begin answers to these people so they can begin that healing process, um, it means the world, it means the world to them. And they're really grateful. And a lot of the families are just, you know, they're often surprised. They're like, I can't believe law enforcement's really been working on it all this time. And it's, it's important for people to know, like, law enforcement, you know, they're relentless. They work really hard on these cases. But you can't solve every problem in life with just more labor and more manpower. Um, sometimes you just, you have to, you have to move to newer technology and technology that can provide that certainty that we were talking about. So I think um, what we do really well complements the efforts, the hard efforts of law enforcement. They've collected a lot of facts. They have a lot of information. Usually we just have to give one little piece uh, from the DNA that helps put all the facts into perspective, contextualize the case in whole, and allows them to go do what they do. You probably know most cases are not solved exclusively with DNA, but DNA can be an important piece Yes. to tie together other kinds of evidence that they've yes. had. And so putting that all together, giving them that one little piece so they can go back to doing the good work they're doing, that's what we want to do. And if we can play even the smallest role in helping get someone connected back to their family, even if they've already been killed, uh, we want to do that. We don't want anyone to remain unidentified, and we don't want anyone to feel like they've never gotten an answer as to as to who um, harmed their loved one and why. I forgot to ask you, when, when were you guys in existence? When did you start? We started the company in 2018. And uh, we spent, uh, spent a good few years. We started working uh, investigations in 2019, but we spent a good few years really trying to build up the capabilities. I think, I think early on it was important to show people that this could work. But once you show it works, the question is, like, does it work once or twice or does it work all the time? And so in the beginning, our focus was to show that it works. Now our focus has been to show that regardless of the type of evidence you've got, regardless of the agency, regardless of the agency's capabilities, if they have a lab or don't have a lab, and regardless of kind of, you know, the nature of the case, there's technology that can be inclusive of all of these types of inputs and can bring value where there's previously been no value created because the legacy technology is not good enough. And I think, I think 
the last couple years uh, for me have been consumed by um, trying to show that this can be used broadly and there's not a not a one-off tool that works this time or that time and that's what this booth was trying to capture is is the sheer magnitude of impact that is possible when the right pieces align between investigators technology and a little bit of funding that's sprinkled in yeah this is like you know in the true crime this is this is all new it seems like you know and people are starting to talk about it and 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 you guys are getting positive attention for what you guys are doing and helping these cases and that's why I'm, I, I saw you guys here and I'm like oh I have to talk and, and, and find out some more details of what's going on um, one of your employees you, you got great employees working for you um, one of them I said this is the future and she said no this is now this is yeah the, this is the now yeah I know this is this is the future of real time this is happening right now we um, I, I can't stress how robust and powerful this technique is and so so getting the word out plays a, a big big role and you know, public support's important because people should understand what's happening. They should be able to ask questions. And so it's important to us to appear at events like CrimeCon so that we can we can answer questions, meet people, talk to them about their cases, answer their questions about other cases, and um, and, and really help to kind of make this kind of a mainstream kind of thing. I so can't wait to come out to uh, the, the Woodlands where you guys are yeah. based and come check it out, do a podcast and educate people more and stuff like that. Yeah, we have a, a wild facility. Um, as, as, you, as you saw, the, the people here are just, you know, our folks are really passionate. Some of them working around the clock to get answers. And it's, um, it's exciting to see a few people that are advocating. But when you come to our facility, in addition to the lab, you'll see a team of people that are just really on fire about trying to do the best they can to get answers. And it's, a, it's, a, it's really a fun, it's a fun group. And I love coming to work every single day. I couldn't have um, asked for a better team of folks to work with. Awesome. Dave, I thank you for your time. I appreciate it. Um, thank That's you for a real the, pleasure. the insight and uh, look forward to coming to your location and we'll, we'll do some live streaming there and, and, yeah, sure. and, and, and share, you know, you guys are it. You guys are it. And uh, let me ask you something. The, the criminal nowadays to commit a crime and they, they pretty much are not going to be able to get away with it anymore, are they? I, I, I will definitely tell you it's not a good time to be a rapist or a murderer. Yeah, uh, I can imagine. But thank you for your time, Dave. Thank right, you. Pleasure.